Welcome to the Frontier AETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood, our medical director, to introduce our guest. Well, our speaker is very familiar to everyone on ECHO, and it's a real pleasure to have Dr. Hillary Liss back with us. Hillary is a provider here in our medicine clinic and in the adult medicine clinic here and medical program director for the newly named Frontier AETC. And she's going to talk to us about a really landmark change in the cervical cancer screening guidelines. So I think this is really exciting. And Hillary, thanks you so much for doing this, and I'll turn it over to you. Hello, everybody. I did want to talk about this. I did send out an email via Brian that gave some information about the new screening guidelines, but if you're anything like me, it helps to hear them many times. And I feel like they're just confusing enough because they're getting closer to the guidelines for HIV uninfected women, but they're still different enough to just make us totally confused. So. Without further ado, I'm not going to spend too much time on epidemiology and pathogenesis of cervical dysplasia, but I did want to remind everyone that pap testing is a good thing. It was introduced in the mid-20th century, and at the time, cervical cancer was the leading cause of cancer deaths in women, and now it has decreased to the 14th leading cause of cancer deaths in women in the United States, and we really do attribute that to cervical cancer screening with pap smears or cytology. In 2012, over 12,000 cases of invasive cervical cancer were still diagnosed in the U.S. with over 4,000 deaths. And almost 200,000 women die each year worldwide, probably 80% in resource-poor countries where cervical cancer screening is not performed. In terms of HIV, as we know, cervical cancer is an AIDS-related cancer, and the incident rates of cervical cancer are 2 to 22 times higher in women with HIV. Almost all cervical cancer is associated with HPV, and there are 100 different types of HPV. Over 40 infect the cervix, and about 13 are thought to be oncogenic, with 16, 18, 31, and 33 thought to be the most common types of oncogenic HPV. 6 and 11 cause genital warts. A reminder that cervical cancer is an AIDS-defining condition, and back when we used A, B, and C conditions, cervical dysplasia was considered a B condition. So let's move on to the current cervical cancer guidelines. So there are a number of different guidelines, and I just want to review what they are and their different functions. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, American Cancer Society, the ASCCP, which is the American Society for Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology. They have combined recommendations that really talk about the age, interval, and frequency of screening, and those were updated in March 2012. The ASCCP also has consensus guidelines, and they're really about management of screening and colposcopy results, and those were updated in 2006 with minor changes in March 2012. And then the guidelines that I think all of us really adhere to the most are the IDSA, CDC, and Health and Human Services Opportunistic Infection Guidelines. And those really address both the screening and the management of the abnormal pap smear. And those were just updated in October 2015. And all of these really have the ultimate goal of cervical cancer prevention via screening, evaluation of screen-positive women using colposcopy and biopsy, and treatment of women with biopsy-confirmed high-grade cancer precursors. So here's our question number one. We have an 18-year-old woman who was perinatally infected with HIV who presents to establish care with you as she transitions from her pediatrician. A careful sexual history reveals she had sexual intercourse for the first time three months ago. What should you do for cervical cancer screening now? Should you, A, do a pap smear now and repeat it in six months? B, pap smear and HPV now and repeat in six months. C, pap smear within one year of her first intercourse and repeat in one year. Or D, wait until she is 21 years old to initiate annual pap screening. I made a slide here to talk about when you start and stop cervical cancer screening in both women without HIV and women with HIV. Because like I said, there are so many similarities, but they're different. And I know a lot of us, including myself, we see women both with and without HIV, so I think it's just good to see them side by side. So in terms of the age to start screening, women without HIV now can start at 21 regardless of risk factors. And they really, really recommend that you do not start screening prior to age 31. There's a difference in women with HIV. It's recommended that women start within one year of onset of sexual activity, but no later than 21 years of age. In terms of discontinuation, Women without HIV can stop at age 65 if they've had three normal PAPs or a PAP with HPV negative, usually within five years of turning 65. 
But women with HIV are really never to stop screening. We are supposed to screen them throughout their lifespan. In terms of hysterectomy, I feel like this is the question that comes up probably the second to most. We'll talk about the question that comes up the most, usually from Dr. Harrington, which is, what do we do after hysterectomy? And the recommendation for women without HIV is that we stop if the hysterectomy was performed for benign reasons and there's been no history of CIN2 or greater for 20 years. Basically, if a woman has had CIN2 or greater, then they should be screened for 20 years after the last CIN2. In terms of women with HIV, we are able to stop if a hysterectomy was performed for benign reasons. But if there was a history of CIN2 or worse, really people should have annual vaginal cuff paps. And then if someone has been HPV vaccinated, regardless of HIV status, there's no change in cervical cancer screening. And then one really big change is that that second pap smear that we've been told since the beginning of HIV that we were supposed to do within the first year of diagnosis is no longer required and is considered C3 recommendation. That it says in the guidelines, expert opinion still says you can consider another PAP in six months, but it's really not recommended anymore. So from the beginning, you can really start annual PAP screening. In terms of women less than 30, women are recommended without HIV to get a PAP every three years. Women with HIV were told that you do three annual pap smears, and if three consecutive pap smears are normal, then every three year screening is appropriate. Co-testing pap and HPV is not recommended for screening in women less than 30. That does not mean you will never use HPV in women less than 30, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. It is still okay to use it for screening for ASCUS paps but it is not recommended for screening regardless of HIV status. And the reason for that is that there is so much HPV in women less than 30. And most of that HPV, thankfully, will regress. And we would end up doing tons of procedures that were probably not necessary. In women greater than or equal to 30, if you're using pap testing only, then women without HIV should continue to have paps every three years. But women with HIV, if you're doing pap test only, same recommendation as in the less than 30 age group. Annual pap smears times three, and if three have been consecutively normal, then every three years pap testing is okay. Now, for the first time, we have been allowed to use pap and HPV co-testing, which I don't know, maybe I'm just a little bit of a cervical cancer nerd, but I started crying when I read these guidelines, so I was so happy for our patients. So we now, just like in women without HIV, if they have a pap smear and an HPV test that are both negative, you can co-test, which means doing pap and HPV again in five years. They didn't really let us go that crazy. They said if we have a pap and an HPV that are both negative from age 30 on, then we can co-test in three years. Okay, 32-year-old woman with HIV comes in for her annual pap smear. She has never had an abnormal PAP. She is very pleased to learn that she may only need to have PAPs every three years, and you co-test with a PAP smear and HPV testing. Her results show a normal PAP and positive HPV. And I just feel like this is going to be our big bugaboo. This is what's going to happen all the time now. So she has a normal PAP and a positive HPV. What do you do now? Do you A, refer her to colposcopy immediately? Do you B, ask the lab to perform HPV genotype testing? Do you C, repeat PAP and HPV in six months, or do you D, repeat PAP and HPV in one year? This may be a trick question. There may be more than one correct answer. But choose whatever you would do, because that's what I'm interested in. OK, so most of you would repeat the PAP and HPV in one year. Some of you also said to refer immediately to colposcopy. I think both of those answers are actually not totally unreasonable. I think D is the best answer here. And some of you, 21% of you said ask the lab to perform HPV genotype testing, which is also a satisfactory answer. Repeat PAP and HPV in six months, 14% of you said, and thankfully we don't have to do it that soon. So let's talk about what the guidelines show. So if you have a normal PAP and you're HPV positive, one thing we can do is just co-test in one year. If in one year both are negative, then the current guidelines actually don't really make it very clear for us. If someone doesn't have HIV, they say co-test in three years, which is actually less than, you know, as a shorter interval. They don't tell us what to do in HIV. So I don't know if that means we should co-test in a year one more time, or if we can just go back to co-testing in three years. It's a little bit confusing, and I'm hoping we can get some clarity on that. If you co-test in one year and have a PAP of ASCUS with any HPV result, you go for colposcopy. Or if your PAP is negative and HPV positive, then you go for colposcopy. 
Another route that you can take is when you get that normal PAP and HPV positive, you can go right to HPV genotype testing. Just a show of hands, how many people are using HPV subtyping or genotype testing? Okay, I see a few hands. Okay. So if someone is 16 or 16, 18 positive, then you're supposed to go right to colposcopy. If you're 16 or 16, 18 negative, then you can co-test in one year. This is a pretty complicated issue, and while I'd say the current, the new guidelines don't really push genotype testing, they do offer it. There is an article that just right before I walked in this room, I'm like, hey, I wonder if anything is new. I turn on the computer, there's an article that's November 15th, 2015, so from the future. I got an article from the future for you, where they actually looked at just this situation, where they looked at women with a normal PAP and HPV positive. And if it was HPV positive, 16 oncogenic type 16 positive, it was those women had about the same risk of developing CIN3 as women with LSIL over five years. Now that was over five years. So I, I still am not pushed that we need to be testing everyone with genotype testing because I think personally genotype testing will rarely change the plan significantly, increase the risk of unnecessary colposcopies, and it's expensive. It's, $250 to $300 just for the genotype testing. And I just think that even if there's an increased risk of cervical dysplasia over five years, I don't think there's likely to be a significant change from a normal PAP with HPV positive over the course of a year. And I think it's reasonable to take the left side of this flow chart and co-test in one year. But I think the jury is still out, and we will send you the link to this article because it's very interesting, and it's from the future. Okay, so this is exactly what we already talked about in the flowchart form, but I just wanted you to have the table right there just as a reminder what to do with normal PAPs and HPV positive. So what do you do when you get an abnormal PAP? Well, it's pretty exciting because the ASCCP has these beautiful algorithms, and I've put one below for you to see. And they're available for free on their website, and the link is right there. And they're also available as an app for $9.99. I bought it yesterday because I just felt like I needed to buy it so I could tell you about it. And it's fantastic. You can type in anything about your patients and what their PAP results have been, and then it shows you what you do next. And it, for the most part, it's very, very similar to what you would do in women without HIV, but very with the exception of ASCUS and LSIL. And we'll talk about that in just the next slide. I included specifically this algorithm because this is what I think Bob and I talk about, like, I don't know, once a month, because we both keep having to look it up. But if someone has cytology that is negative for intraepithelial lesion or malignancy, but endocervical cells or transition zone is absent or insufficient, this kind of walks you through what you can do. And basically, if women are age 21 to 29, you just do routine screening. If they're greater than 30, it really recommends that you do HPV testing. And if HPV is positive, then you do cytology and HPV in one year. So that's a little bit different than you might do otherwise. If HPV is negative, you just go to routine screening. And since we will be doing a lot more HPVs on our women, I think this will really help us um, to make decisions when endocervical cells are absent. So if someone has ASCUS or LCIL, low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, so if someone has ASCUS now for women of all ages with HIV, we can do reflexive HPV testing. And if HPV is positive, you should go right to colposcopy. If HPV testing is negative, it's actually a little bit unclear as to when to repeat the PAP because, again, while these new guidelines are great, I feel like maybe they were so eager that they forgot to talk about some of the follow-up. So they didn't really talk about if you have ASCUS HPV negative, do you repeat in one year or do you go to repeat in three years? I would recommend repeating the PAP plus HPV reflexively if it's ASCUS in one year. If HPV is not done, repeat PAP in six to 12 months, and if greater than or equal to ASCUS, then go right to colposcopy. LCIL or anything worse than LCIL, you go right to colposcopy. And that is different than women without HIV because in women without HIV, they're doing a lot of triaging. Sorry, women without HIV. <laughs> they're doing a lot of triaging with HPV. And this is for regardless of age. So just a reminder that the one time you can use HPV in women less than 30 is with ASCUS or sometimes in follow-up of an abnormal colposcopy. We're recommended to check. All right, here's our last question. 
A 28-year-old woman with HIV comes in for her first antenatal visit at nine weeks gestation. She is Gravita 3 Para 1 and has had a history of genital warts now resolved. She reports six male partners in the past year. She has never had an abnormal pap smear. You perform a pap smear and the results are low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. What do you do now? Do you refer her to colposcopy now for biopsies and endocervical curatage? Do you perform HPV testing and if negative, repeat the co-test in one year? Do you plan for colposcopy in six weeks, six weeks postpartum? Or do you refer to colposcopy now for biopsies only without ECC? Okay, and most of you said plan for colposcopy six weeks postpartum, and I agree with that. Another quarter of you each said perform HPV testing, and if negative, repeat the co-test in one year. And again, unfortunately, in women without HIV, we are not supposed to triage LCIL with HPV. LCIL is a diagnosis that needs to go to colposcopy. It's just that sometimes in pregnancy, we can defer it. And also, some of you said refer to colposcopy now for biopsies only, no ECC, and that's also a reasonable answer. So in terms of pregnant women with HIV, screening should be the same as in non-pregnant women. It's okay to use a cytobrush. I think people get real nervous about that, but it is okay. You really want to avoid invasive interventions in pregnant women as much as possible. And so the only finding that would affect management, timing, and route of delivery is invasive cancer. So most, all the guidelines say that you can defer colposcopy for ASCUS and LCIL until greater than or equal to six weeks postpartum. You should do an immediate colposcopy for HCIL or atypical glandular cells. A biopsy is okay, but you cannot do endocervical curatage in this population. And then if you suspect that someone or prove that someone has cervical cancer, they definitely need to see Gynoc to talk about treatment and delivery planning. And here is the algorithm from the ASCCP guidelines for managing women with LCIL. Colposcopy is one option or defer colposcopy until at least six weeks postpartum is acceptable. Just a quick reminder about HPV prevention. We now have the known avalent Gardasil 9. I will not be surprised if Cervarix goes away. I'm not sure if that was ever being used in any significant numbers. And I think Gardasil is going to be phased out as well. And I think Merck is really going to focus on Gardasil 9. But what I wanted to point out is that in the new guidelines, Gardasil 9 can be substituted for the other HPV vaccines in all situations. Wherever we used it before, you can now use Gardasil 9. If you're mid-course with a Gardasil vaccine series, you can switch to Gardasil 9. The question I get a lot is, well, what if someone's completed Gardasil or Cervarex, and then they want to make sure that they are protected against these additional five HPV genotypes, should we revaccinate them? And the answer right now is no. There's no data to support that. And in fact, when they did have some women that got some extra Gardasil 9, they didn't have as good of an immunogenic response if they'd already received Gardasil. There is really no data on Gardasil 9 in HIV-infected people, but nonetheless, the guidelines have embraced Gardasil 9. So here are just a few resources, all the guidelines I talked about, and my information if you ever want to call and discuss cervical cancer screening. It's a passion of mine. I'm always happy to chat or email me.